Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. After a bad attempt, maybe you take a couple of months off from studying and get some perspective. Remind yourself that the GMAT is not the only thing in life and uh, kind of move on and focus on other things and then come back when you feel ready. I met my wife at NYU Stern uh, during my MBA and I asked her out on a date and she said no. And a month later I asked her again and she said no. And then another month went by and I asked again and she said no and so on and so on for the entire duration of business school. So almost two years. And then eventually at the end of school, she said yes. And now we're married and we have a kid and we're very happy together. But I think that that's kind of uh, like it requires a certain tenacity, I guess is the word, to keep trying at the face of failure and be okay with failing. Because it's only through failure that we can really appreciate the success. If everything just came easy all the time, then we wouldn't really appreciate it that much. Spending time in nature, I, I find, always helps me with, uh, with perspective. That's why I like to, to go for a bike ride early in the morning, because when you're out in nature and exercising and stuff like that, then it kind of puts everything else in life in, uh, in perspective. And nothing, nothing seems like that big of a deal anymore. I want you all to think of the GMAT the same way you think of athletics. When are you ready to go race on a marathon? When are you ready to compete in whatever sport it is that you play? With athletics, the only thing that would prevent you from getting better is if you're just really old. Like if you're my age, then from there things are probably not going to improve, they're only going to decline. But otherwise, if you're, if you're practicing a sport, you just get better with time and practice. And the same goes with the GMAT. So you're right. You're never really ready because you can always get better. And that was true for me as well. The first time I took the GMAT in 2006, I got 750. But then after a few years of teaching it for Manhattan Prep, I got a 780. So does that mean that I wasn't really ready for the test the first time I took it? In, in a sense, yes, it does mean that, because I didn't score uh, to the best of my ability in that first test. Right? I, I left 30 points on the table, you could say. But then you have to ask yourself, is it worth, spend, is it worth making this my full-time job for five years to get up from 750 to 780? And for most people, the answer is no. I think for everybody, the answer is no. Uh, so on the one hand, you're never really fully ready. On the other hand, you don't really need to be fully ready. You just need to be ready enough, right? Now, I think it's really important what you said about being slammed at work, because that's a, that's a significant factor that can affect your performance on test day. So for example, I've seen that people tend to do much better on the GMAT when they have just come back from vacation than when they are just about to go out for vacation. I'm talking more than a hundred points difference. And uh, sometimes with tutoring students, they, they say, I really want to take the test on such and such date. And I ask them why. And they say, well, because the, the following day I'm going on a two week holiday. And I always say the same thing. I say, then don't take it on your way out to the holiday. Take it when you get back. The best thing you can do for your GMAT score is not touch anything GMAT related for a couple of weeks. I had a, a student a few years ago, she uh, took the test in June and got a 710 and really wanted to go to Stanford. So she needed a higher score. She found me in August, so a couple of months later, and she said the, the problem is that she spent those two months leading a group of teenagers on a bicycle camp coast to coast in the U.S., so, uh, so now she feels like she has to basically start from scratch because ha she hasn't touched the GMAT in two months. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you telling me that you spent the last two months biking with a bunch of kids in nature from coast to coast? And she was like, yeah, from, I think it was from Boston to Santa Monica or something like that. 
And so I, I ended the session right there. I told her, look, you need to take the test tomorrow if you can. Like if you can find an appointment, take it tomorrow. And I predict you'll get a 740. And she thought I was completely nuts. She was like, w what about all my flashcards? Uh, can I at least go over my flashcards? I'm like, no, burn those flashcards, take the test tomorrow. And she did. And I got an email the next day. She got a 740. And she was completely shocked. Uh, but I was not. I was like, yep, that's exactly what I thought would happen. So keep that in mind as well. If you're slammed at work, yeah, maybe now is not the best time to take the test. But it doesn't necessarily mean you have to keep studying. I think a lot of people think, oh, I have to study hard, especially in the week before the test. It's the exact opposite. Right? You want to be ramping down your studies and bring it all the way to zero uh, for at least a week or two before the test, because then you are fresh, you uh, slept well, you didn't have nightmares about the GMAT and the nights leading up to the test. It's not top of mind for you. It's not a big deal. It doesn't feel like a big deal. And the other thing that I would say is uh, try to make test day feel like any other day. So that means that you're going to sleep at the same time every night for at least a week. You're waking up at the same time every morning for at least a week. You're having the same breakfast. You're drinking the same coffee. You're... Whatever your routine is, try to make that routine available to you for test day as well. Because again, that makes it feel like less of a big deal. The only caution there that I would give you is um, if you take two days completely off work right before the test, that can make the test feel like a really big deal. And that can no. increase anxiety. So uh, I don't know if it's possible with your work, but if it is possible, I would take a half day off each of those two days. And when you say do nothing, it's important to do something, because if you do nothing, then all you're left with is thinking about the GMAT and exactly. stressing out about the test. Yeah. Uh, so exercise, read a book, binge watch some TV show on Netflix, uh, something that will uh, keep your mind off the test. I remember when I took the, yeah. uh, the Israeli SATs in 1997, that's how old I am. The test was at noon, and I remember my dad asked me to just watch cartoons all morning before the test. And you don't, you guys don't know my dad, so let me just tell you, my dad has never asked me to watch TV in my life. In fact, it was quite the opposite. I, I wasn't allowed uh, any access to any video games or TV or anything like that as a kid. So that was uh, the first and last time that my dad ever said anything like that to me. But he was right. He, he understood something back then that, that I didn't understand yet, which was that you need to rest your brain before you're going to be using it very intensely. And the biggest mistake I see people making, let me give you an extreme example of that. I once met a student who uh, came in for tutoring and uh, she gave me her history of, of studying for the test. And something just didn't make sense because I was looking at her profile in Manhattan Prep and I saw that she took a practice test on the Manhattan Prep website on the day that she's claiming she took the actual test. And I was like, there's got to be some kind of mistake. Maybe you're confused. That, that couldn't be the date you took the test. And she said, no, no, that's correct. I, my test was in the afternoon, so I took a practice test in the morning. So that's an extreme example. I, I hope none of you would ever think of doing such a thing. But when I look closer into her profile, I see she actually, she didn't just take a practice test that morning. She took a practice test every day of that week, leading up to her actual test, including the morning of. And, uh, and you could see the scores going down, 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 progressively lower and lower every day of the week uh, and culminating in a very low score in the actual test. So that's an extreme example of what not to do. And what we want to do is the exact opposite of that. Hey, I'm just going to interrupt my own video for a moment here. If you're finding value in this video, please let me know in the comments below and give this video a thumbs up. It really motivates me to keep uploading a new video every day. All right, back to the video. What do you think they're testing in this question? The subject matter is definitely divisibility and remainders. That's true. To me, I think what they're testing is, will you panic when you read a long word problem? Or will you remain calm and relaxed and take your time and think it through and mm -hmm. do the math? 
I think the hard thing about this question is just being under timed pressure with a timer ticking and, and being at the test center and, and being anxious. Uh, I see that a lot with students. In fact, let me share with you all an, an analogy that I just thought of uh, when I was riding my bike this morning. What a lot of people do with word problems is they think that they need to go through the problem as quickly as possible so that they have time to work on the math, right? And so when I was biking, I thought, hmm, that's kind of like they're thinking that the start of the problem, they're going downhill, they're biking downhill, and, and then at the end of the problem, they're biking uphill. That's where they slow down and they uh, take their time. And the way I do it is the exact opposite. So I, I think of the beginning of the question as where I'm riding uphill, very, very slow. And then at the end of the problem, that's where the downhill, the, you know, the easy part is at the end. So the, the beginning of the problem, when the, when the question first pops up on the screen, that's the part that's going to be difficult. That's the part that's going to require a lot of time. And if I do a good job, then the ending will just be like riding downhill. You don't really have to do anything. It just kind of happens automatically. And by the way, this goes not just for word problems, that goes for literally everything on the GMAT. So for those of you who have seen my approach to critical reasoning and sentence correction, you know that that's true there. It's certainly true in reading comprehension and it's true all across quant and, and integrated reasoning. The, the difficult part is in the beginning. That's where you want to go really slow. And I can tell you that I don't think I've ever had to reread any text on the GMAT, ever. Because if, I, if I'm finding myself reading something a second time, that means I didn't do it correctly the first time. Why would I have to read something a second time? That would only happen if I read it too fast the first time. But if I pause and digest what I'm reading, and pause and make inferences, then I don't need to reread anything, and then the ending is very quick. It's either very quick because I did a good job, or it's very quick because I realized the question was too hard for me. And I guess I'd move on. But either way, I'm not going to be there over two minutes because I either it's either easy at that point or it's not, in which case I guess I'd move on. So I think that's probably the single biggest factor that most test takers need to, to change. It's, it's a habit that has to be changed. A question pops up on the screen, I'm going very slow, and then either speed up because it's easy or speed up because it's hard. Either way, I'm speeding up at the end. That's the part where you're riding downhill. So if we read this question very slowly, what do we see? We've got a worker, and when I see a, a worker carries, I'm immediately putting myself in the worker's shoes, making it personal. So I'm, I'm carrying jugs of liquid soap from a production line to a packing area, carrying four jugs per trip. I'm really visualizing that. So I've got two in each hand, right? And I'm visualizing these uh, liquid soap jugs that I'm carrying. If the jugs are packed into cartons that hold seven jugs each, so I pause there and I say, oh, seven jugs per carton, but I only have four jugs in my hands, that means that I'm still going to be filling that first carton in my second trip. Okay, that's kind of annoying, right? Because seven is not a multiple of four, so I'm a bit annoyed by that, but it is what it is. How many jugs are needed to fill the last partially filled carton? I pause there and say, well, I don't know. How many cartons are there? How many trips are there? I don't know anything. After the worker has made 17 trips. Ah, okay, so I've made 17 trips, and I know that I'm carrying four jugs in each trip. So if I were to pause and make an inference there, this is how many jugs I'm getting, and I'm putting them in packs of seven. So we're dividing that number by seven, and I know that there's a partially filled carton, that means that there's a remainder. So I, uh, that means that 4 times 17 is not going to be a multiple of 7. But I already knew that because neither 4 nor 17 is a multiple of 7, and 7 is a prime number. So yes, I knew that this wouldn't work out nicely. What is 4 times 17 then? It's like 4 times 20 minus 3. Right, so 80 minus 12, so what is that, 68? 68 doesn't go into 7, as we thought. 
Now from here you can do it one of two ways. You can say 68 over 7 would give you, what is it, 9 remainder 5? Like how many times does 7 go into 68? Well, it goes into 63 9 times and then you have a remainder of 5. Or alternatively, since they're already asking how many more are needed to fill, so they're not actually asking for the remainder, they're asking for the opposite of the remainder, like what's missing, then you could say, well, 68 is just under 70. 70 would be the next multiple of 7, so I just need two more. And therefore, the answer is B. I think this question is only hard if we're in a state of panic. If you're looking at a number which, when divided by 7, has a remainder of 5, and you add 4 to that, you're going to get a number which, when divided by 7, is a remainder 2. And you can make it more general, like that. So if you take two numbers, the first of which, when divided by 7, gives you a remainder of 5, the second of which, when divided by 7, gives you a remainder of 4, you're definitely going to get a number which, if divided by 7, will give you a remainder of 2. Okay. okay. That's always going to be true. Now, we are very used to that kind of thinking when the divisor is 10, because then it's just units digits. All right, if I said there is some number that ends with a units digit of 8, and I want to add to that some number that ends with a units digit of 9, what would be the units digit of the sum? 7. That's right. So here, what are we looking at? We have a number which if you divide by 10, you get a remainder of 8. That's that first number. Then we're adding to that a number, which if we divide by 10, we get a remainder of 9. And we're saying that the sum, if you divide it by 10, would give you a remainder of 7. And that we were doing in grade 1 or 2, right, with, with a divisor of 10. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.